Welcome to this second section of the summer school. Uh, the title of this session is The Shifting Contours of Economic Dependency. And we have as a distinguished speaker, Carolina Alves, who is Associate Professor at the University College London, uh, Professor of Economics. And I have known her uh, by fame and through her work uh, for quite a, a bit of time now uh, as an engaged uh, intellectual. She was a John Robinson Research Fellow of Heterodox Economics at Girton College in Cambridge. And now uh, she is uh, Associate Professor at University College of, Lo of London. But besides this uh, engagement in uh, um, economics and in research and also in the effort of reforming economics, she's also engaged uh, uh, socially and politically. So she is co-founder of Diversifying Decolonizing Economics, which is a network uh, of uh, scholars uh, that uh, is active in this, uh, in, in the attempt of diversifying and decolonizing economics precisely. And, but she's also in the board of the uh, Progressive Economic Forum, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so she will uh, talk to us about economic dependency from a very specific point of view related to finance. And thank you very much, uh, Carolina, for being here. Uh, as a discussant, we have uh, my, our col UNCTAD colleague, Giovanni Valencisi, who is uh, also a, a graduate from my alma mater, uh, by the way. And, <laughs> and uh, he uh, worked at the Africa and least developed countries divisions in the, and uh, contributed to their flagship reports. And he is now in the office of the Secretary General of UNCTAD. So uh, I'll leave you immediately to, to it. Thank you very much both for being here. Thank you, Ursula. That was a very kind uh, and nice introduction. So I'm really happy to be here. So um, yeah, thank you, um, of course, Ursula and Jay, but also the Young Scholar Initiative. I was just talking to Jay two minutes away, two minutes ago, like, you know, for when we were here, but we, I was a student, so. That was a bit sad in a way, but good, no other way. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for inviting me and well done for uh, going on for such a long time. It's an important forum for those uh, in the early stage of career and trying to find their way, especially in economics, uh, that very often the doors are very um, are closed to some different perspectives. So yeah, so I've been uh, asked to talk about economic dependency but I pushed a little bit for what I, I know best, uh, which is the, this economic dependency, but from the perspective of finance, financial integration. And that's what I'm going to try to do here today. But also I, um, I decided to bring the case of Brazil, which was um, my uh, uh, case study doing my PhD. And the reason for that is because the more I teach now, the more I realize that we do need examples and uh, you know, concrete uh, discussion of things. So uh, I, I hope that starting with Brazil will help us to understand this more abstract uh, and theoretical discussion that's related to having, having a framework to discuss um, financial integration or international capital flows and so on. Um, okay, so you know, the, the outline is quite simple. Uh, I, I will start with Brazil general discussion, just point it out, point, trying to point it out, uh, you know, what's missing, how developing economies behave, and then move straight uh, to the discussion of financial integration, and then how, you know, uh, some approaches are dealing with that, and what international financial subordination is bringing to the table, that's new, or maybe it's not new. <laughs> it is also for us to discuss. Um, so this is the, the, the outline of uh, our next uh, 44 minutes. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so for those familiar uh, with Brazil, in the 1990s, we have a, a series of reforms in Brazil. Uh, we are um, coming out of uh, the last decade. Um, we're gonna, we also becoming a democratic country after years of dictatorship. And, uh, and a lot was discussed uh, about uh, finding stabilization for the government bond market in Brazil, which is something that was, it, it tracks back since the 1960s with, uh, you know, the dictators doing the dictatorship, the need 
to have this stability to be able to finance development and so on. And, uh, you know, in, by the 90s, um, the economic policy that uh, uh, drove that uh, reforms are very much based in that, you know, the mainstream approach of get government deficit control. Um, so, of course, uh, the question of balanced budget that uh, many of you uh, are familiar with. And uh, the question, when I was looking to the period of 1994, 2014, uh, the Brazilian economy was running primary surpluses. Uh, that is what we have before you pay interest rates. And the debt was still increasing. And obviously, you know, most of the economies on the heterodox side at the time, and, and now we're pointed out is like the, the high, the burden of uh, high interest rates and so on. But that uh, kind of got my attention because, you know, in theory, if you are with all these strict measures, and those familiar with this context, we know that the shrink of the government in terms of spending was intense, and why still we have the increase of the, the debt. And I have this graph here where we have the net um, debt on the left axis, and then the primary surplus, uh, primary surplus on, on the right, no, yeah, net on the, the left, yeah, and the primary surplus on the right. And then you can see the trajectory a little bit. Uh, and you know, even when you have the decline, there's a lot of methodological change on how the public debt is calculated, which kind of brings like a bit of doubt of, uh, oh, I heard something, no? Yeah, anyway, yeah. So that's the context. So we have this reform. And then, of course, many economists were spending, you know, a lot of ink trying to understand what, is that someone talking to me? No. Oh, okay. So I can go. Okay, okay, okay. So, sorry. So, you know, we have the more like mainstream literature, of course, going after uh, the, the gov government spending too much money, the high debt costs, of course, and a lot on the central bank management of this debt. And you have the heterodoxy saying, look, if you're running primary surplus, it's obviously it's, that's not all, right? There's another story here. Uh, and then there is the financial cost of the public debt. That's not just a matter of a uh, high rate of interest. There's the cost of monetary policy in this context of financial and commercial opening, right? How will you keep the country stable when you start having this uh, uh, inflow of capital at the time when the data is the time when uh, we are going through the opening of the Brazilian economy? That's part of the reforms with the idea of having foreign savings to invest and then reach development um, and get into this path of economic development. And of course, here's something that Hachun uh, mentioned already. Uh, what we see in Brazil and now, there are more and more empirical studies showing that most of this capital that came <laughs> went towards finance and speculation, much more than actually productive investment, but that's definitely not the kind of lecture. But that's what's happening. And of course, the government is finding a way to keep the exchange rates uh, stable, while also controlling this liquidity that we have in the market uh, doing these um, capital inflows. Uh, so it's a mixed bag when you look into the heterodox literature. Mind you, I, I didn't even spend time with the mainstream literature because it was, you know, uh, we have um, fantastic economists in uh, well, FJ, I'm not gonna remember her name, you know, she, I don't know, maybe after Daniela can help me out, but she'd say, look, it's just arithmetics, arithmetics. You know, surplus, there's no way that this is about primary surplus, there's no way this is about uh, uh, fiscal policy and so on and so on. And then it's clear that we can look at the cost of the monetary policy, which I'm gonna expand a little bit, the cost of foreign reserves accumulation, right? The interest pain of foreign exchange swaps that will happen, it will happen uh, every time that the exchange rate, that we have exchange variation, especially a little bit before the financial crisis, but during the financial crisis as well, we have this, um, uh, this policy of foreign exchange swaps, which is more central, bank kind of uh, swaps. And then, you know, the monetary policy tool, which many more mainstream economists would disagree that that's a tool, a monetary policy tool, but that's again, a little bit of this discussion of, uh, which also perhaps is not the place of how uh, the framework you're trying to understand developing countries has the Eurocentric views, right? Because monetary policy tool, you know, in countries like Brazil, you're going to involve so many other different things that just like target the inflation uh, rate uh, and so on. So we have um, 
all the new, like the re repos, the forex chain swaps, as I say, with discount operations and, and so on. And I was trying to try, you know, I was trying to make sense of what was happening. And to me, the common point that you could see in, in that discussion is that in, this increasing reliance of the state on government bonds and financial innovations, that's the case of the forex exchange uh, swaps, to run its apparatus. And here is where most of my research is, because that's where I link with financialization, right? The state itself, the role of the state in developing countries, not just implementing neoliberal policies or the regulated market, but the state is also transformed in terms of getting to that uh, path of financialization in terms of how it operates, which kind of policy the government has to start using to then uh, control its financial market and so on. But that's, again, I'm saying a lot of different discussions. I can't avoid to go off a tangent a little bit. So yeah, so that's what I found there. And to me, you know, is that new? I came across at the time with uh, some literature such as uh, Daniel Gabor, which at the time when I was doing a PhD, she was more known for being a political economist. And one thing I was trying to do is to first kind of look into what economists are saying about that more than anything else. Uh, although political economists are economists in a way, but uh, yeah, so, uh, sorry, no thanks to anyone. Um, so uh, foreign uh, debt evolved into the cornerstone of modern financial system, used as a benchmark for pricing private assets, for hedging in a base asset for credit creation via shadow banking. The state role as a debt issuer, passive and systemic at once, has been reliant beyond the arithmetic of budget deficits on the intricate working of the repo trinity, which is her own uh, research. And that really got my attention because if you have a mainstream trained, you know that uh, we just have an uh, issue of bonds if you have that, if you have to cover the, the deficit, or if you have a, a development plan where we're gonna have a government investment and so on. But then reading this was like, okay, what is happening here? What really uh, she means? And then I also came across uh, Eric um uh, which I met doing um you know doing my my summer school with Levy Institute and uh you know he also uh, has this paper from 2016 saying once it's recognized that treasury securities insurance issuance has a monetary policy component one can understand why in a monetarily sovereign government the treasury may issue more securities than its budgetary needs and why the treasury cares about many other things than funding itself when issue securities. And you know, and all these may be, seem very obvious for those working in the bond market. I remember interviewing uh, people in the bond market, like, yeah, of course we do this. And do you look at the central bank uh, or central bank literature? Yeah, we do this. But I got really obsessed. So, okay, if everybody knows we do this, why you don't teach our students that we do this when you're doing, you know, monetary and fiscal policy? So I got into this path of, of trying to work that out. And, and then it became even more telling because even the, the IMF and the World Bank admit that that's the case. Um, you know, government financing via government bonds and therefore fiscal deficit means greater liquidity and a decline in government financing may lead the government's issuing debts not to finance expenditure, but to support the development of liquidity of a uh, domestic fixed income market. And it's quite interesting this because uh, at the beginning of the 2000s, especially in countries such as Brazil, there was this massive, uh, you know, together with conditionality regarding IMF, you know, lending and so on, that you have to develop your government mar your government bond market. That was one of the conditions. Most of, uh, there are two or three key uh, documents in 2001, 2002 for developing countries that comes under the umbrella of debt management. No, what's the name of that? Debt management something. That all these developing countries, they have to get into it and um, to develop the government um, bond market. And, uh, and a lot of this has to do with this question of liquidity, stability, and so on. And, and, and I got just very curious with that discussion, right? I mean, okay, so, you know, surprisingly after four years undergrad and a master, I just come to find out that government, uh, they issue bonds for all the reasons um, the in deficit. And um, so when you, you know, oh, sorry, and if you want to know more about this, this is a good literature as well discussing more, no, more, more 
more, sorry, no more in the sense that uh, is a very technical discussion of how we should do this without the implications and without uh, explaining why the government bonds uh, has this role. Um, so, you know, if you look our our theories is in academic circles, like if you look at the debate of public debt in academic circles, what you have that is like public debt is associated with fiscal policy and the impact uh, on aggregate demand. And that, of course, is a Keynes um, legacy. In, in the government bonds, that's something I like to argue, are seen as passive, right? They are outcome of something else. They're not active. They're not something that is actually playing a role. They are consequence, like casual, ca causal, casual. Anyway, they're consequence. And then, um, so that's what you, you learn. And, and we do learn as well that they are too, to manage risk and costs of the public, uh, the, the public debt itself, which is the debt management thing, how you deal with maturity, how you deal with index and so on. But in all these cases, right, the public, net need, public debt needs to be managed or eliminated to avoid the burden, right? And that's where the austerity gets in, you know, the discussion of uh, government stop spending. But the question is, what if the increasing of the public debt is not associated with fiscal policy? So what, you know, why, why are we not discussing the costs that monetary policy has for governments through monetary policy and the increase of the public debt as well? Um, so, you know, again, uh, just a, a little observation, because of course, pre-1950s, we have this dominance of fiscal policy, but poor, well, not pre 1950s, but 50s, 60s. But then in the 50s, we, we start having this development, especially for Musgrave, on um, you know monetary policy enters in that debate. But still, it enters as you know following this discussion of a bond finance expenditure, expansionary fiscal policy, the question of multipliers or not, and so on. Um, so uh, if I could summarize that, in, in, um, I, there is the PDF ver version of this presentation I, I gave to Ursula, and there is an annex with the literature I'm summarizing here. But uh, the way I would summarize, like government bonds are passive, what that means. With most of the approaches we study in our normal um, uh, economics training, government bonds are a reflection of fiscal policy, and there is no direct specific analytical discussion of how they are a crucial tool in managing and controlling financial markets. This is in academia, if you're doing economics, if you're not doing a central bank or financial kind of management where you get into the discussion beyond that in a much more technical way, or if you're a researcher for IMF, a researcher for IMF or, or, uh, or the bank, World Bank, where you see this, this uh, technical aspect as well. And uh, there isn't uh, a clear discussion on the fact that the government bond assume you know, a much broader role in achieving a sound economy in which, uh, sorry, in achieving a sound economy in which, in, in which they actually are used to control, to manage, to supervise the financial market. Um, I think there's something missing in the second bullet, but that's, that's uh, the, the point. And, and of course, to go back to Brazil, this to me was very clear because this period that was a study, 1994, 2014, you can at least highlight four main drivers of the public debt, right? You have the serialization policies, the rise of hedge mechanisms, you know, before the, this uh, can get very technical, we can come back to that in the discussion. We have, again, the foreign exchange swaps. You have the reverse foreign exchange swaps, the foreign reserve accumulation. Um, and all of these is linked to the government trying to manage the country when we have this capital inflow, when we are in this more international, this open um, scenario, the, the financial integration, the financial globalization. So all these, yes, of course, repos operation and even serialization policy can be tracked, can be tracked down in the 60s. But then this became like a core uh, part of, uh, let's say, the, the management of uh, uh, the Brazilian economy with uh, the financial opening and, and et cetera. Oh gosh, this is a loaded slide. So um, the findings that we, you know, I, I have from that is there is, of course, a link between uh, government bonds and financial markets, which, in the literature, is discussed in a more mainstream uh, side through uh, Okun, for example, or the other one that I forgot his name now, um, 
Yeah, but, it, but as I said, even in the context of, uh, it's still in the context of, um, of a fiscal policy and so on. Um, and, you know, there is this question of uh, why we have this type of goals and tools of monetary policy in the context of uh, economies such as Brazil. So why monetary policy assume that role? Uh, that's very different than developed economies. Uh, and then there is the question of uh, governments, you know, together for that obviously issuing bonds not to finance expenditure, uh, as a bit repetitive here. Um, yes, the IMF, the World Bank are aware of this, but at the same time, you find same same documents by the IMF, the World Bank calculating the public sector borrowing requirement, not considering that cost of the monetary policy. Actually, there is an error in their calculation. The error is what refers to monetary policy, which probably was like this pre-financialization, pre-opening, pro but clearly this borrowing sector uh, requir requirement formula has to be updated because otherwise we still focus on fiscal policy, right? When uh, actually what generates the cost is the monetary policy. Um, so yeah, so so monetary tools they respond to no non fiscal imperatives, um, you know, which are not, not related to uh, government fiscal policy, but to this financial integration and the monetary policy that follows to keep stability. Uh, and that is when that's where many economists in Brazil they get that and they call a uh, stabilization trap or speculation stabilization trap or um, and in in that, that kind of a. Uh, difficult situation to, to, to get out. And, and then, okay, so if you realize that the monetary, the government bonds, all this question of finance, the way the government is operating is linked to this financial integration, is linked to the question of cross-border financial flows, you know, in my mind, the first thing I thought, okay, so do you know, let's drop a little bit this um, discussion in government bonds, and let's look at the literature on, you know, global financial globalization, financial integration, and see what they are saying about that. And, uh, you know, again, here is a slide with many references uh, of authors trying to understand what's happening at this level of the financial integration. And mind you, here, I didn't even get into the more mainstream macro that is, uh, you know, having like the model, model model regarding uh, open or closed economy and so on. I'm just really focusing on the traditional literature on, on this uh, current account um, capital and then the empirical part of it. Um, and, you know, it's still in this literature, which especially the second bullet point that is fantastic actually, I still miss the, you know, focus on uh, what was happening to the, to the, to the, to the government bonds in that context. But that's what this literature is, is giving us. And I'm not gonna spend much um, time on this, but there is the reference and we can come back later. Uh, so we also have a much more um, interesting uh, literature trying to understand that more under the international political economy umbrella or the, you know, uh, um, economists trying to understand the international monetary and financial system. So we have all this tradition come from Ash Green, Suzanne Strain, of course, uh, Maria, Tavari, Maria, Maria Constant Tavares from Brazil. I don't know if she would classify herself as an international political economist. I think she's an you know, economist, a heterodox economist, but is, is that, and by the way, Tavares was trying to understand that in, a, in, in the 1980s talking about the hegemony of dollar and sadly we don't study her uh, enough um, but yeah so there is this literature and I really recommend this paper from 2010 you know which kind of summarize a little bit what this literature of international political economy or heterodox economy is trying to do we have the post Keynesian literature as well that folks more on current hierarchy trying to understand that stabilization trap and of course you have uh, Daniela Pratz who is in the room uh, very uh, afraid of being speaking about that topic of her in the room. She's uh, very well known for her work on this and others that follow her path as well. And, and now we have in a, a Federal Fluminense in Brazil, an uh, interesting uh, group thing that is looking into that as well. We have the Marxist approach and I think this um, 
references are a bit Eurocentric in a way, uh, but also that are looking into what's happening to the state in that context, how the state is managing this um, uh, financial and commercial integration of developing economies and, and so on. So we have all this happening, right? Trying to understand what's happening from the 19, from 1990s onwards, when um, after globalization, right? You don't forget in the 1990s, globalization was welcomed even by uh, heterodox and more critical economists, right? Because it was like, okay, this is, this is gonna work. Um, so now we have all this very radical or more critical theory looking to this uh, international monetary system and in highlighting how developing countries are in a very difficult position, which is not, um, you know, it's not only what dependency theory or institutionalism theory we're talking in the 70s regarding trade and so on. There's also this financial co component that's not only about where to find money to finance development, but all this question of um, uh, the integration of uh, countries such as uh, Brazil in international monetary and financial order with the rise of uh, this financial innovation or trade of financial assets or securitization um, dynamics, which many economists are uh, understanding that under the umbrella of financialization. So that's a kind of uh, a place, a, a new challenge for this um, more radical or critical uh, literature. So if I could summarize, and here I'm really uh, being very um, simplistic in a way, but if I could look into all these um, uh, approaches to um, you know, trying trying to understand what's happening to financial globalization, to financial integration, to capital flow and inflow. I would have these four uh, bullet points, and I know it's uh, very ambitious to try and to summarize that way. But you know, it's clear that we have this internal internalization of the capital that was there before, but now there is this financial component. There is the question of this dollarization of the credit system at the international level of most of the assets that are denominating dollar being taken as uh, safe assets. Uh, in in, in a, a set of policies, uh, inter especially in the 90s, uh, regarding the regulating uh, this, fin this, this international financial market. So in a way, allowing and promoting this internal internalization of capital very often under the umbrella of that's the only way developing countries can achieve development. They need the money. If they get the money, they will develop. Uh, and you know, in one point that we see very clear is this lack of monetary and fiscal policy, the boom and bust cycle, constant external vulnerability, and you can go on and on and on. And this is another uh, point that again Daniela Pratt's uh, know from back to front. So you know, so we, we do have this problem. We have, yes, the rise of developing emerging economies now, but they are still in this subordinate position. And why they are in subordinate position, right? Because they can't have a, 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 a autonomy, econ a, a economic policy autonomy, or not being able to be to to get away from external vulnerability in that context, and I'm going to expand on that in the next uh, slide. And just to give you uh, guys a recent example, you know what happens during the COVID-19, where we have this stop of um, uh, flows towards developing economy and the and the the, mov the inverse movement, right? The outflow of capitals from developing economies going to developed economies where they could have the safe assets and the implications of that for the exchange rate for inflate for countries following the inflation target regime, which then impact how we could deal with the pandemic, right? Which kind of fiscal space you'd have in that context. Uh, so it is a problem if you get, just to unpack a little bit more uh, uh, on, you know, why this is a problem, more, you know, this subordinate position end up shaping and restricting economic policies from, you know, uh, policy making for industrial development, because, you know, as I mentioned before, you think that this uh, inflow of capital will generate a lot of employment, so would go to productive capital, but very often you're not. What we see uh, recently in many developing countries is the increase of arbitrage operation, but also the carry trade operation. Uh, you know, is the impact the monetary fiscal dynamics, as I mentioned a little bit before, and of course exacerbates class and distributive conflicts 
in many different ways. Uh, B, if you look at the case of finance generate, like the financial industry, the type of jobs that it generates, but also in terms of, uh, you know, the class, the rentiers, the ones that benefit from that kind of um, uh, dependency or this kind of dynamics where financial assets are at the center. Uh, then this implies what's happened to the changes in value transfer within the country, which is the class that's actually, you know, having that that kind of access to that money. And uh, among, oh, there's half Brazilian there, sorry. <laughs> uh, there was, uh, I missed that, very sorry. But there, there are a lot of Brazilians in the room, so I think I'm fine. Um, so, you know, when we look into this, what do we see is this uh, persistent and um, and a structural phenomenon that when this, that's also Brazilian, by the way, is D-E-E-S, here, E-E-D-S is Brazilian. It's Portuguese, sorry. Um, so yeah, you see this, uh, this there's this uh, persistent and structural phenomenon related to this integration of developing, the emerging developing economies into this hierarchical world economy, right? Because it's hierarchical. This integration is not happens in like the playing, in a, uh, in a um, even uh, field. So we need to, that, that's a problem that many economists have already pointed out since ever, but this has been exacerbated in, a, in, a, in the context of financialization. And, uh, and the question for me was, of course, how, you know, we, I, as I mentioned, there are many heterodox, what I would call heterodox economists or radical economists, or, you know, let's say alternative uh, economists look into that, as, as I mentioned before, even in the political economy, uh, economists as well. So what uh, I try to do with a group of uh, other uh, colleagues is to say, okay, so can we try to have a conceptual framework that help us to grasp what's happening, right? And uh, we focus on the dependency theory and the post Keynesian economics and the Marxist studies to see what these three schools of thoughts could bring into that discussion. Because in a separate way, uh, economists coming from this tradition are already spending a lot of time discussing many of the problems I mentioned here in highlighting this, let's say, subordinate position and et cetera. Uh, but, you know, would be, is it possible to bring them together? Can we have this framework to help us have a research program where you move away or have more power, even bargaining power to challenge the, the mainstream theories when it comes to that kind of financial integration, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so we look into these three different schools of thoughts to, to trying to put all this together and um, and come come up with something we call now International Financial Subordination, I, IFS, which I'm gonna then uh, move to explain what that is. Uh, so, you know, to repeat myself in a way, um, this idea of have the IFS is to highlight this persistent and structural uh, phenomenon uh, that is linked to hierarchy in a world economy and bringing conceptual but also methodological tools that are offered by these three schools. And when we are doing this, uh, we come across, uh, we kind of came up with six analytical, what we call six analytical axes that can help us to, to study to study that, that uh, subordinate position, which is history, uh, which has a lot to do with, of course, the colonial legacy, how the financial system in these countries were developed. Um, there is the question of social relations of production. I know that before this discussion, we have a lot of uh, questions regarding these, which take us to capitalism and et cetera, but you know, how these relations of productions are actually developed in, in within capitalism. And the question, of course, of what's productive, what's not productive, you know, what generates value, what doesn't generate value, what is finance in that context. The discussion of money itself, the discussion of state, also no state actors with, the, with financialization and financial development to have so many other very powerful groups now, uh, in play, the players in this financial market. Uh, Benjamin uh, Brown has this uh, fantastic discussion on, uh, is managerial capitalism? No. Yeah, so like the hedge funds role in that in that in that um, discussion, and of course the ge geography and spatial uh, relationships, right, which take us back to this core and periphery discussion, uh, or core in 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 um, 
uh, foreign periphery, yeah. So, you know, how this can be incorporated constantly in our discussions and why it should be incorporated. Uh, and, I, you know, just to be clear, many macroeconomists, policymakers and research, they recognize some of the problems we have uh, mentioned. Um, but for, for, from our perspective, you know, the negative, these negative implications are very often uh, associated with uh, underdeveloped financial, the most financial system. And then of course, documents such as the IMF and the World Bank then gets a lot of space because oh, if you develop, you have a deep financial system, you'll be fine. There's the question, uh, 10 minutes, five? Yeah, I'm almost there. There's the question of um, how uh, institutions in the global south are inferior and so on. Uh, of course, compared to what is the model, the efficient one that are in the global in the global north, uh, or the question of macro mismanagement, mis 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 and here there's a lot, you know, as you probably come across very often, how uh, uh, in that discussion everything becomes about uh, you know a political leader in the global south being corrupt, and then regulatory market failures, which was uh, what the mainstream offer us. So it's about fixing the market and then you'll be fine. Um, you know, in what we're trying to do with this uh, with the IF, I, I, uh, IFS is uh, to point it out that if you don't consider the unequal and hierarchical, um, how the, the world economy is unequal and hierarchical, not because of uh, uh, some kind of uh, mismanagement or a state that's not developed, but because historically that's the position they were, and you have it, why is that position, right? Is, is the question like, are them just a bunch of economies who have to catch up uh, and then become like developed economies or actually they're the mirror of developed economies. They just, they are underdeveloped because that's the condition for other economies to be developed. So all these questions for us should be, which is related to social, the social relations of production and so on. This discussion, we're not giving an answer but we are kind of, uh, you know, screaming. So like, this should be on the table all the time. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think this is almost, yeah, it's the last one. Um, so there is, you know, what they call heterodox school discussing that. Um, but even these schools, again, um, very often you know, we come across many studies that are more empirical. The bus boom and, cycle, boom and bus cycle is an example of that. So without the authorization uh, of that. Um, and, um, you know, we see little attention being paid in trying to look at the, the, the kind of, uh, you know, I, I know this is going to be a, a bit of a jargon, but like, what is the underlying, uh, you know, process of the capitalist accumulation here? What's happening? Uh, how finance fits into that? And of course, uh, you know, uh, very often we are looking to this from the U.S. hegemonic power, but then, you know, what if the starting point is the other side, is the implication, and then, of course, going back to challenge the dollar hegemony. Uh, and that's it. Uh, that's the paper where we developed most of this. Uh, there is a summary. This is our next. There's a summary of what we're getting from the Penis theory, post Keynesian theory, and Marxist theory. The conceptual uh, lenses, the key agents, the empirical manifestations, the driving force, the limitation. So uh, I leave that in, in a PDF for you guys to have a look. Is that? Thank you very much. What? Yeah, yeah. Do you? Yeah, yeah. Let's just. You know where you are. Yeah. Thank you very much. So as you saw, Carolina synthesized really a ton of literature in a short presentation. Um, and what I'm gonna do here is basically try to identify a few key takeaways that speak a lot to my experience of more than 10 years working with UNCTAD. I will provide a few examples of uh, how these notions and concepts that she has presented continue to be relevant to our work as researcher and policy analysis, and then perhaps add a couple of um, considerations on this uh, framework. So in terms of takeaway, I think the, we can summarize the, the two papers uh, on the basis of which she drafted this presentation. Uh, 
and highlight four main points that in my view are extremely relevant. The first one is the, the terms of integration into the global market from a productive or trade side and from a financial sphere are very closely intertwined. And you cannot simply conceptualize and explain it with a, with a simple theoretical characterization. Um, assuming that, for example, it's the net current account position that determines the debt dynamic or external um, debt dynamic, for example, is, is clearly problematic, uh, for instance. An additional point, which in my view also speaks a lot to the tradition of, of uh, ANTA and its work, is that debt is not only a reflection of the fiscal policy and uh, aggregate demand management, but it's also a reflection of how fiscal policy is utilized to increase the productive capacities of the country, doing public investment, key infrastructure, and so on, including state-owned enterprise, as, as we heard earlier in the keynote address. The second point that in my view is relevant is that both from the productive sphere and the financial sphere, the facet of this integration are such that developing countries tend to be in an unfavorable position because both at the productive level and in terms of um, integration into the financial market, they find themselves at times constrained in their ability to pursue structural transformation, sustainable development, including through, of course, expansionary fiscal policy. The third point, which I think is extremely relevant and speaks to uh, a lot of the analysis that has been done, especially in the trade and development report, talking about hyper financialization in the global market, is that financialization and financial integration have taken place also in developing countries, uh, especially since the 90s. It is no longer just uh, a process that uh, uh, touches the developed world of the global north, but also the developing countries. The thing is that despite this, this process has only changed the ways in which the asymmetries that are intrinsic into the global uh, financial architecture operate. So it hasn't redressed this asymmetry, it just changed some of the facets through which it operates. And I think that again speaks to the issue of the continuity element in this discussion and the novelty element in this discussion. And finally, the, the last final uh, takeaway point, of course, is that uh, the notion of international financial subordination could be a useful uh, umbrella concept uh, to characterize this situation. Now, my first reaction is that this is an old, an old discussion, but it's still extremely relevant. I just looked at uh, some of the articles that came out in the last month speaking to this um, financial asymmetries or uh, subordination at the global level. You will see from discussions about investment shortfall in renewable energy to the role of the BRICS in uh, creating and setting up a rival to the dollar as, as a key reserve currency. And of course, the UN Secretary General call for a transformation of the global financial architecture. As you can see, these notions which date back, I think the literature Carolina was citing started in the 50s, they're still being discussed in different forms and ways, but they're still extremely relevant. Now, from my point of view at Anctad, I think one first point that I see as uh, extremely important from the ways in which we try to unpack the situation is the link between the productive sphere and the financial sphere. And in particular, one area where we've done quite a lot of work, including colleagues in the, in the commodity uh, branch, which you will hear in the next few days, Rodrigo, uh, is the relevance of the notion of commodity dependence. So uh, the, the usual working definition of commodity dependence is countries that uh, whose uh, merchandise exports 
is accounted for more than 60% uh, by primary commodities. And of course, you see there the, in the, in the uh, map, most of the developing world, with the exception of the uh, mainly Asian economies, uh, are indeed commodity dependent. Now, how does that affect the, uh, the financial sphere? Well, there are a number of reasons why commodity dependence can lead to boom and bust cycle, notably because commodity dependent countries tend to have volatile macroeconomic fundamentals because typically commodity dependence is also associated with concentration on a few products. So you, you have high chances of terms of trade shock and so on. But also at times commodity dependence leads to crowding out of productive investment into other forms of, of, um, of uh, investment or rent seeking. Of course, you have also dynamics such as the Dutch disease where a windfall of export revenues through commodity sector lead to an appreciation of the exchange rate and therefore undermine the competitiveness of your manufacturing. Uh, typically, this literature argues that institutions play a key role in maintaining the stable fundamentals and mobilizing these resources for diversification. But again, the ways in which institutions operate also has to some extent to cope with the features of the sectors we're talking about. So for example, in a lot of extractive industries, you find that uh, illicit financial flows tend to deprive uh, capital thirsty countries, let's say, from financial resources that they could uh, mobilize for diversification. So the, the very productive sphere, in a sense, affects the way in which finance operates. From the other side of the medal, we've also highlighted, uh, uh, even recently, ways in which it is the financial sphere that, that affects, uh, let's say, the, the real economy way of operating. So recently, for example, when we were doing some work on the impact of the war of Ukraine on developing countries, we highlighted how, yes, over the course of 2022, 2023, international prices of wheat went down by about 27% were expressed in dollars. But for many developing countries, because of the exchange rate fluctuation, the domestic currency denominated price of wheat actually went up. And you see in the example, uh, for instance, in the cases of Egypt or Ghana, these are economies where uh, much of the devaluation was actually due to debt related dynamic, which made the exchange rate depreciate sharply. And at the end of the day, you see that despite international prices going down over the course of the last year, since the inception of the war in Ukraine, basically in local currencies, wheat prices went up. Of course, these balance of payment tensions are even harder to deal with when we are talking about developing countries that are highly dependent on import of sensitive products like wheat, for fuels or food for that matter. And mind you, uh, the majority of African countries, for example, are net importer of cereal. Uh, so we're not only talking about a few countries, we're talking about a number of them. Um, a second point, which I think is a, is a light motif, let's say, of, of uh, Anktad's uh, position on, on the asymmetries of the international financial architecture and the inadequacy of it to address some of the development issues is the lack of long-term development finance. Now, uh, you could trace back this uh, discussion perhaps to the two gap model where you find developing countries lacking uh, savings and external foreign exchange, let's say, to finance their capital accumulation. Of course, the new tweak, let's say, of the last few years is that this is not only a developmental problem, but it has also become a, a climate change problem because financing needs are directly increased by the need to adapt to climate change. Uh, a few years back, for instance, the Trade and Development Report estimated that achieving climate and development objective would require about 2.5 trillion per year 
for developing countries as a whole. And you should add to that all the increasing needs uh, that are stemming from uh, the pandemic uh, and, uh, of course, the cascading crisis, which, which are still ongoing. Despite the, the sharp increase in, in financialization and financial wealth that uh, Carolina's work has also documented and Ankta has also documented, what is clear is that long-term resources remain insufficient to address this challenge. Uh, we are not only finding ourselves in a situation where um, debt vulnerabilities are again on the rise, and you can see as an example, uh, the number of developing countries where public debt exceeds uh, the, the um, arbitrary threshold of 60% of uh, GDP. If you see on the top graph, uh, we are back basically at, a, at the level where we were before the debt relief of the HIPIC and uh, MDRI initiative right now. But it's not only that, it's also that uh, typically public debt is more costly for developing countries than for developed countries. And that despite the fact that if you look at the neoclassical literature, you should have uh, international capital flowing to the countries where it's more relatively scarce. So, um, and so for instance, you see there the bond yield for Germany being 1.5%, uh, whereas in Asia is 6.5%, averaging out the last two years. Um, in Africa is even 11.6%. Um, and again, another element of this lack of long-term development finance is that ODA remains at half the level it should be according to the SDG target of the 0.7%. The second uh, broad uh, aspect that I think speaks a lot to Angtad's uh, position in this literature is the volatile and pro-cyclical nature of short-term capital flows. So as, as Carolina was showing, of course, big capital inflows should in principle uh, signal increase in uh, appeal to international investors. But the problem is that when flight to safety dynamic kicks in, they deprive capital, uh, they deprive developing countries from capital precisely at the time when they're starting to face balance of payment pressure. And COVID was an excellent example of that. Uh, again, you're, you're seeing in the graph documented some analysis from the TDR, I think, where you can see this cyclicality, particularly on the part of uh, portfolio investments. There is also, um, an ongoing shift towards more complex and typically more costly to manage financial instruments. And that applies to both the commercial but also the concessional ODA related sphere. And at Ancted uh, with the least developed countries report, we've documented this and we've shown that not only ODA is increasingly uh, assuming the form of concessional debt, but there's also an increasing reliance on uh, blended finance and other instruments, which are harder to align to the country's uh, development strategy. Um, sorry. Uh, finally, and that's the last slide for the sake of time, <laughs> um, two additional considerations that I think are quite pertinent to this. The first point is that I think one element uh, that Angtad's work has undercovered in which this uh, subordinate position of developing countries emerges in the financial sphere is that of illicit financial flows. A few years back, we documented in a report that Africa is losing 88 billion per year in illicit financial flows. And these are mostly flowing towards financial centers, which are typically in, in um, northern countries. Um, this also shows that uh, it is important to account for the new forms in which this um, international financial subordination can operate in a way at the intersection between the real economy and the uh, financial side of it. The second point that I think is, is quite important to this, uh, to this literature is that 
I think there's an increasingly apparent link between trade, finance, and the environmental sphere of dependency. If you look at the uh, physical quantities that are accounted for in international trade, uh, our analysis has shown that basically the lack of structural transformation and domestic value addition mirrors into a pattern of trade where basically most of developing countries are extracting resources uh, and exporting it at very low value added for the consumption of the global north. And that is a pattern that in the literature is known as ecologically unequal exchange. At the same time, as we said before, higher adaptation needs and more frequent and more intense disasters compound the debt vulnerability, especially in a context where a lot of the climate and development finance is provided for uh, in, in the form of debt rather than grants. So again, this interaction between the environmental sphere and the financial sphere, I think it's quite important and it's something that emerges from our work. Thank you very much. I hope you